thing uh, to get all the controls across it. the bottom. It's recording. I got it. All right. Okay. So we are recording. This is for the record, so to speak. So uh, based on my, there are roughly 20 slides here. Um, based on going through this with Tom and all the other members of SPRC, my expectation is 40 to 45 minutes uh, will get us through the presentation. I'm going to, I'm going to try to hit that number because that would offer us about another 40, 45 minutes of conversation on this. And, and this is a really important conversation because it, it's not just our present, but it's our futures we're talking about here. So, um, if, if there's anything that I say or anything that's on the slide that's unclear, if it's unclear to one of you, it's unclear to more than one. So please go ahead and ask me a question right then. If you want to question a statistic or what it means or anything like that, I would ask you to save that for questions at the end. And with that, we'll jump into the deck. And hopefully, Gene, it'll, it'll keep up, you know, so that you're not always a slide or two behind. But I'm going to try to go now back to the display screen. Slide two. Are most people seeing another slide come up? Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. good. So what are the survey uses and what are the audiences? There's really three uses and well, two audiences for this. So first, the survey is a snapshot of who we are and how we feel and, and what our hopes and our fears are as of today. And for that, the audience is everybody, right? It, it's all of us. <clears throat> uh, the thing that sort of drove the timing of this was using the survey as a guide to help in appointing our next pastor. So in that case, the audience is more focused. It's SPR, it's the DS, and ultimately it's the cabinet and the bishop. And we, we did provide um, actually a um, uh, this a snapshot of some of this to Samuel Hong. And he's also gotten a written narrative that goes through it, something that would be easier for him to share up the chain, if you will, with the cabinet and the bishop. And he had indicated in coming back to us that he really appreciated the thought and the effort that had gone into this. And we should rest assured that it would be a factor in discerning our next pastoral uh, appointment. So, so at least, uh, you know, we're making sure that the powers that be know that we're interested in this topic and, and we're doing everything we can. Um, the third area is the one I think that matters starting off with this council and with the larger congregation on a going forward basis. The survey is a guide to taking action uh, as a congregation. You know, the audience for this is everyone. Uh, the reason we wanted to make sure we got input to the appointment is depending on who we get you know, appointed as our next pastor, that may expand our options in one direction. It may constrain them in another. You know? So that's the reason we wanted to get this guidance out or, or get this, these thoughts out as soon as possible. So now the question is, can we trust the data? Uh, the survey went out to the email list. And Robbie, the email list was, it was augmented uh, with uh, a couple of names that might be associated with the youth group, but weren't on the, the primary list. So it's a slightly augmented list. The reason I say about 400 is because there are some duplicate emails in there. You know, there are a few people who get emails under, you know, uh, under a couple of different addresses. So there, there may be, I tried to take out those duplicates, but I may have missed some. So about 400 church connected people, we had 102 responses, which is a 25% response rate. If we were a commercial business doing a customer survey um, with no incentive, by no incentive, I mean, if we were offering everybody a five bucks Starbucks gift card in return for responding to the survey, well, that would have been an incentive. But if we didn't do that, and if we were a commercial business doing a survey, getting anything approaching 10% would be considered phenomenally good. So, you know, so we had good engagement uh, in terms of the survey. Um, statistically, we have an 8% error interval at a 95% confidence level. So a moment about what that means. So here's an example. Let's say that there's a question we asked the, the, in the survey and it had a simple yes, no answer. And 58 or 60% of the respondents said yes was the answer. 
Well, that means that we can be 95% confident that had all 400 people responded instead of just 102, that the response that the people who voted yes would have been a number somewhere between 60 minus 8, 52, or 60 plus 8, 68. You know, and more importantly, it means that we can say if, if, if we got like a 60% response on something, we can say it definitely represents a majority of our congregation statistically, if that makes sense. So now comes maybe the more important question, can we trust the questions themselves? Were the questions leading or somehow constraining in their responses? Now we started up, the, our model for the survey was actually a, a, a product produced by a church consultancy firm. Kate happened to have a copy of it and made it available to Jennifer and I, and that formed the point of departure for building this survey. Now, obviously, this, this form was designed for congregations that do their own pastoral selection, you know? So, so it's intended for a slightly different audience than us. We made a couple of changes to it, but we tried to stay in, in within really the guardrails that had been set up there to make sure that we had a quote, professional set of survey questions. Um, now, what we often, uh, some questions have a single answer. I mean, you know, if, if somebody asks you what your age is, hopefully you don't give them two competing responses, right? I mean, it's, it, there's just a single answer for some questions. Those are easy. There are a lot of questions that may have five, six, seven, even eight possible choices, right? And what we didn't want to do was ask people to rank order everything from one to eight, because statistically, uh, by the time we get past our top three or four, you know, the numbers are, are small enough that we can't really tell, you know, is number five really number six or is number eight really number seven, you know, that kind of stuff. And what we really wanted to do was focus on the things that are most important to us as a congregation. So when we ask those questions, we ask people just to rank, if there were eight choices, just give us your top three in rank order. The other thing is there's none of what are called Likert scales. You see those a lot where it just says, is this important to you? One is it's very important. Five is it's not important at all. We didn't ask questions like that because unfortunately, they tend to induce a bias and people will come back and give everything a one. It's the easiest answer. And you just say, everything's important and everything is the most important it could possibly be. So we asked people to, to focus on what are their top three. There were, I think, just two questions in the survey and we're gonna come back to those questions towards the end of this. There were two questions that actually didn't let you say your top three. You had to pick one thing and only one thing. Um, and the risk of having questions like that is introducing a false choice, right? Uh, and I know Tom and I had extensive conversations on how to make sure that we weren't treating the answers to these questions as a false choice. So what I wanna do is illustrate that. Here's an example of a false choice. Our government comes to us and says, do you want COVID vaccine distributed fairly or distributed quickly? That's a false choice. The government had, you know, had a year to get ready for this. The government should have had a plan to, uh, to be both fair and fast with distributing vaccines. And it would be unfair to turn to the citizens and ask them to say what's more important. But now at the, at the other end of the scale, here was a news article about, I don't know, three, four weeks ago when we were, you know, out briefing this survey. This is up in Ukiah, you know, so what happened was a freezer broke and all of a sudden a hospital administrator had to decide fast or fair. And there wasn't, there weren't any other choices. It, it could either be fast and the vaccine got distributed while it was still useful, or it could be fair and fewer people would get vaccine and they chose to vaccinate people. So what, what we're saying here is sometimes we will be called on to make difficult choices. So we try to at least explore in a couple of places, how does the congregation feel when confronted with that kind of a very difficult situation? First question we're gonna talk about, what's your age? I want everybody to stare at this chart for a minute. <laughs> uh, and then we can look in the mirror and we can say, you know, some congregations can refer to themselves as aging, 
Um, I think we are, we're more past the aging and more towards the aged. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're getting up there uh, well, when it comes to our demographics. You know, uh, an absolute majority of us are age 71 and older. And by the time you get down to being in your 50s, you're definitely in a minority situation around here. Now, where does this really matter? It matters in what's called affinity. Um, you know, one of the things that people do when they show up at a church, and, you know, Kate's got some anecdotes to talk to this. Uh, Samuel had an anecdote that he shared with me um, uh, to talk to this. Generally, when people visit a church for the first time, what's the first thing they do? They look around to see if there are other people who look like them in the congregation. You know, because we, we feel affinity for those who we think share our life experiences, generally about our same age. They're probably going to have the same outlook. They're going to be people we can get along with. And so if you are 18 to 30 years old, and if you fall into that young adult, young parent category, and you look around and say, are there people in this church who look and probably share my values and, and beliefs? The answer is probably not. Uh, if you are the parents of teenagers, and, and something we focused on for years now is how are we going to get a, a more, you know, back to the days when we had 30 people, you know, showing up in our youth program on Sunday evenings. You know, we often had that back when Sharissa and I, you know, went through our six-year tenure as uh, youth counselors. Um, but so you might see some, but you're not going to see a lot if you fall into that demographic. Now, if you're an empty nester, if you're somebody who's living in Los Gatos, you've sent your kids off to college, or maybe now they're out of college, um, and if you show up for the first time here and you look around and say, are there people like me in this church? The answer is yes. You know, so as we look across sort of the demographic boundaries, young adults, young parents, parents of teenagers, empty nesters, empty nesters can look around and see themselves reflected in this congregation. Did you grow up in a church setting? Um, no, yes, and it's Methodist, or yes, and it's other. This is interesting. I mean, um, people didn't come to us because they see a sign out front that says UMC. Um, they're here because our, our success, I think, is based on our people and our message and not the sign out front. Conversely, Kate, the Methodist Church doesn't have very strong branding, but I don't think that's, I, I think that's true of all the mainstream, you know, the mainstream Protestant denominations these days. The branding is just not there. But it does point out that people attend our church, it's a matter of choice, not a matter of course. That's what's changed over the last decades. It, it was, you know, when some of us were growing up in rural Virginia, you know, you, you may have had a choice between the Baptist church and the Methodist church, but not going to church was not a socially acceptable choice. That is not the situation anymore. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, the, the no answer, I, you know, that one at the top, um, I'm actually encouraged by that, that over 10% of the people who responded to the survey, and, and I'm going to say roughly 10% of our congregants, are people who chose to affiliate with us and affiliate with church, even though there was nothing in their background that would lead them to do that. And honestly, we're going to have to emphasize that cohort a lot more if we're going to have success on a going forward basis, because we're not getting people who have remained in a church kind of environment, you know, that cocoon throughout their lives. So this is where I'm going to show everybody. So this is not data from our survey. <laughs> I want to say that right up front. This chart comes from the Pew Research Center. I think it's affiliated with the Pew Charitable Foundations. These guys have done longitudinal studies of Americans' attitude towards religion for a long, long time. So they're probably the gold standard when it comes to understanding the role of faith in American life right now. If you look at the red bars at the top, we're going from the silent generation through the boomers that's me, through Gen X and on to the millennials. Um, when we get to a millennial population, Christians are now a minority in the United States, you know, 40, only 49%. And, and the point is, 
Um, the number in three generations has gone from 84% of Americans professing to be Christians to 49% in four generations. Uh, that trend is precipitous and there's no reason to expect it to change. You know, what I've now, now that I've been looking at some religion oriented blogs or church oriented blogs, um, it's called the rise of the nuns, not nuns as in N-U-N-S, but N-O-N-E-S, the none of the above. When people are asked a religious affiliation, 40% of millennials don't have a religious affiliation. They may be looking for spirituality in their lives, but they don't think they're gonna find that in a traditional religious setting. Um, if you take a look at you know, people, the blue lines, people's um, ongoing engagement with the church, then we basically see the numbers flipped. The, the generation born between 1928 and 1945, 61% were in, in the pews on Sunday at least once a month. If you look at millennials, 64% are maybe in the pews a couple times a year, maybe not there at all. So we, we're basically seeing this inversion in both affiliation and in participation. Uh, if you were to map young adults, families, and empty nesters against that, the empty nesters are now encroaching in that baby boom phase right there. But again, parents of teens and young adults and families, it's not just the kids who aren't growing up in the church, it's the kids of the kids who aren't growing up in the church. And then it'll be the kids of the kids of the kids who aren't growing up in church. So those are the secular trend lines that we face. So now let's talk about ourselves. And let's, you know, we'll jump into how we feel about things as a congregation. So remember I said, we're going to look at our top three. So we asked this question twice. Um, why do we think most people attend LGUMC? And then why do we personally attend LGUMC? So the question was asked a couple of different ways. Um, worship experience, fellowship and community were numbers one and two. And statistically, they're close enough to each other that I would say they share first place. We, we like our Sunday morning experience and we like the sense of community that we have with the other congregants. And then there's a big jump, you know, a 20 percentage point jump. And then there's two things that are close together, teaching and preaching and music. So the point is we, we have a top four, we don't have a top three because you know, numbers three and four are too close together to call it. The other thing to note is if you compare that middle column, why do we think everybody else attends and why do we attend? The numbers track one, almost one for one. You know, I mean, the, the, the ratios certainly track and they're just a few percentage points off. This is reinforcing that message about affinity. We're here and we believe everybody else here is here for the same reasons that we're here. You know, so affinity is really strong in building strong, connected congregations. What do we aspire to do better? Uh, we want to be connectional. That, that's the thing that comes across at the top. 84% of us is about being connectional. And then numbers two and three were again tied, but there was a gap down to whatever came below that. So a, either community engagement or first impressions, you know, both outreach oriented things. Uh, came in to fill out our top three. So we, we like the connectedness among ourselves and we want to extend that connectedness to visitors and to our community at large. And that, I think that tracks well with our narrative about ourselves, you know, when, when we talk about being a service oriented church. This one's tough. Um, we are realistic, but wishful is probably the best way to put it. So we, again, we were asked the question a couple of times, do we think we're going to continue to shrink because we're just gonna be current members and current members don't last forever? You know, where do we see the church in five to seven years? And where do we want the church to be in five to seven years? So it was asked both ways. Let's look in the lower right-hand corner. You know, first, you know, a majority of us, not, not a huge majority, but, a, but slightly more than half of us are holding on to that ideal that we wish the church would be bigger and, and be growing based on bringing in new members in the next five to seven years. But only 1%, actually only one person, bless his or her soul, 
only <laughs> one person actually believes <laughs> that we're going to get there. Now, if you look where our actual beliefs are, we are evenly split. As, as a congregation, we, we, you, you, we cannot collectively decide whether we're going to succeed at finding enough replacement members to hold our own or whether our future is just a continued decline in numbers. Yeah, that 49 to 50%, that is statistically well into the noise. Uh, we're basically evenly divided on whether we can hold our own or not. Now, if you look over at the, the 3% and the 41%, they add up to 44%, of course. So does that really mean that you know, almost half of, you know, a little more than half of us wish we could grow. Does that really mean the other half wishes we would shrink or just remain <laughs> static? No, no, it doesn't. But there's a cognitive bias, basically, that people don't want to be wrong. So what I would say is slightly more than half of us still wish we could grow. Slightly less than half of us have come to accept a belief that we're not going to grow. I, I think that probably reflects what the data means. But I am not a social statistician, so uh, you know, you get what you paid for in this case, which is just a personal opinion. And I, I'm going to try to be clear. There's several places in here where I'm going to definitely insert my personal opinions. I will try to be clear in in outlining those as such. Tom, you and I have talked about this ad infinitum. So if you catch me uh, exhibiting my own bias in here, please unmute and. Uh, notify me right away you know what's the future of our church we are still very traditionalist when it comes to our future even though we don't have the the base of people in here to say that we could attract young families a full 94 percent of us put families as being the future of the church in our top three now two-thirds of us say empty nesters are in our top three and about a little more than one third believe that seniors are in our top three. I guess the rest believe we already got enough of them, right? <laughs> but, um, but that's sort of where we are in terms of where do we see our future. I, I, there's a disconnect here between what, who we are as a demographic and who we would like to come be with us. You know, so that's, that is um, oh you know, a, a, a bit of an indicator right there. I heard a hmm, so maybe there was a question. No? Okay. Somebody yawned, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is there is this old story about, you know, the preacher in the pulpit doesn't mind when the congregation falls asleep. It's just when the preacher falls asleep that it gets embarrassing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Kate's, Kate's going thumbs up. So speaking of pastoral stuff, what do we want? We want it all. I mean, there's, you know, I went ahead and showed the, the, the graph, the way it came out of SurveyMonkey, because it pretty much says every attribute of a pastor, we'd like to have, it. and there's not a huge amount of difference between our favorite and our least favorite, but I will say thoughtful and pastoral, though that's at the top of the list. And th that theme of being pastoral, you know, of having somebody who is the good shepherd caring for the flock, that theme is going to return a couple more times as we work our way through our data and our, our feelings about our church. What skills do we want in our top, in our new pastor? Um, well, it's a dead heat uh, for number one and two. So basically we have a tie for first place between we want a preacher and when it gets to, you know, the individual questions, um, you know, we all loved uh, Jennifer Murdoch's sermons. And there's a strong bias towards saying if we could get another Jennifer Murdoch when it comes to uh, preaching, we'd like to have that. We want somebody who's visionary. You know, we, we would like to be led and led into the future. And then there's a gap down, um, which is statistically significant gap down. Uh, and the, the third thing in our top three is being able to attract new members. And that probably reflects a little bit of that tension between our wishes and our expectations, right? It, it's still in our top three. Now, where do we want the, the preacher to focus the time and energy? Um, number one, again, we want that worship experience. We want that Sunday morning in the pew experience. 
again, about the same percentage who, you know, talked about new members in the prior question, talked about new members here. So 85% of us, uh, the number two spot is attract and retain new members. Uh, we really don't have a top three, 70% and 68% are too close to call. So uh, our number three is either small groups or it's pastoral care. You know, that we're, we're fairly consistent. I mean, at least, you know, we're not jumping around and asking for one thing here and another thing there. Um, although I will come back to that topic towards the end. What do we want in our sermons? Well, you got a tie. Actually, you got what amounts to a three-way tie here. So what we want in our sermons is, notice this. We want them spiritually nourishing, the one in the middle, but we want them applicable to our everyday life. And that bottom one, we want them to be drawn from our pastor's everyday life. Once again, just like we seek affinity with each other, we are seeking affinity with our pastor. We want, we want a pastor who we can look at, who looks like they've lived through all the same things that we've lived through, and their, their life experiences to date are relevant to our life experiences, and they're giving us sermons that actually make that application. We want, we want that kind of connection with our pastor, right? We, we definitely say we're a connectional church, and it's coming through, not just on the congregational side, but the congregation with the pastor. <clears throat> so this is the first of the two difficult questions uh, that we asked. The ones where we, we provided four choices, and you could only pick one. So you had to make a decision here. Uh, experience growing new ministries was, it, it won by a plurality. It didn't win by a majority. If we were in Georgia, we would have to rerun this election, right? <laughs> Thank God we're not because there'd be a bunch of people, you know, they're talking about fraud in our voting machines and all that kind of stuff. But, but um, a, a plurality and almost majority said experience growing new ministries if we only got one thing. Now, personally, I found it intriguing that in a time when online ministry is the only kind of ministry we have, we didn't put online ministry skills very high on our pastor. I queried uh, SPR about that, and there was a general consensus that we could hire that skill. It didn't have to be the pastor who had that skill. So if the pastor only gets one accomplishment in the first year, this is an even tougher question, right? This, this comes down to, okay, we know what they're going to put into it. What are we going to get out of it? And here, this one's going to be particularly tough for the DS and the folks at the chain to deal with because we're, we're tied. We can't decide whether we want to grow or whether we want the remaining members to be nurtured. That's an important distinction right there. Those, those are, are neck and neck. Renewing our vision, strengthening, we, we don't seem to feel overly attached to our current ministries in that, you know, we would, we would definitely prefer to grow new ministries to just hanging on to what we've got when it comes to the ministry side of things. But when it comes to pastoral care, are we more about that? Remember, we had half of us who thought we're, do, we're in a sense, in, in, essentially, we are going to shrink. And the other half thought we could hang on. And we see that split here, too. It's if, if we're, if we're going to shrink, then we just want to be nurtured. If we think we might be able to hang on, then we want to grow numbers in ministries. And that leads to this. So this is an engineer's view of the world. I'll, I'll acknowledge it right off the bat. But what I'm trying to do is sort of reverse engineer the decision matrix that a Samuel or that um, a cabinet or that a bishop is, is going to take away from this. Remember, we had a couple of, of difficult questions where we don't, we don't fall into a definite camp, right? So let's look at the blue stuff, the, the stuff, I'm, I may be pointing to the wrong side for you, I apologize. But the stuff in blue are long-term expectations we are evenly torn between shrinking and being sustainable at our present size. If we look at what, if we only got one pastoral accomplishment in year one, what's the thing we get off to? We are evenly torn between nurture our congregation or grow our numbers in ministries. Now, I have not 
shared this particular graphic <laughs> with Samuel, and I don't plan to because it, it sort of begs the question of, of what he would do with it. But let's say we, we, we've now gone through the process, a decision's in front of the bishop. The bishop says, well, I'm going to respond to the half of them that said they expect to shrink and they want to be nurtured. And if that happens, then we're going to get what I would call a transitional pastoral appointment, which means someone who, whose job over a five to 10 year period is going to focus on preparing this congregation for a future that no longer has an LGUMC. That, that's what I mean by transitional. Um, if the pastor uh, is appointed to be a rah-rah, you know, go get them. I'm going to create new ministries and drag people in here. Well, now it, the pastoral accomplishment is to grow when the congregation thinks we're going to shrink. That is akin to having a boss who says, I fully expect you to fail in this assignment, but it's a mandatory assignment. Who would take that job? You know, and I, I wouldn't wish it on a pastor unless I really didn't like them, you know, so um, and then I wouldn't want to be at that church, you know, so yeah, it's a catch it's a catch 22 there. Now, if the bishop responds to a congregation asking, you know, who believes we can sustain our numbers, but we want to be nurtured. Well, in that case, the responsibility is going to fall on the members to find more people just like us and bring them in here. And then finally, in order to sustain our numbers, we still have to add new members. So if, if what we do is get a pastor who's focused on reaching out to new people, not with the intent to make this a mega church, but with the intent to make this a sustainable church, then the pastor would be tasked to focus on ministries that could execute what I'm calling a replacement strategy. It's not a strategy designed to reverse the last four or five decades of American culture and take us back to an era when 25 year old families started showing up at the church doors, it would be something focused more on how do we get empty nesters uh, who look and feel a lot like the people who are already in the congregation to be here. I'm gonna pause for a moment before Tom unmutes. This is, a, this is the beginning of a long congr Congress that a long, congregational conversation about our vision for the future. I'm offering only my opinion on this right now, and I want to caveat it that way. So here's a personal view of affinity. By the way, we're almost, we got like one more slide to go, and we're going to be at 45 minutes. So thank you. We, we're, we've gotten here. So a personal view of affinity and a member replacement strategy we should not go out and ask for a young growth oriented pastor. If, if there's a young growth oriented pastor out there, they should be tasked to find other young people and build a church around young people. That's a personal opinion. Um, and, and Kate, you had an example, which you may choose to share with this group. Uh, it was your coach who mentioned uh, the experience of a pastor up in Washington, who was that young rah, rah, let's go grow the church pastor and who was brought in to try to grow a congregation that probably looked and felt a lot like ours. Um, can we build, you know, what we have often said is, well, if we could just get teen, teens in here, if we could get people into youth group, then their parents will be connected. It's true. That, that is a true statement. And I've, I've heard it, you know, for all the time I've been here, that well, we got a high school next door, we ought to be able to, you know, to grab some of them and drag them over here. But the point is, when parents are looking for a safe place for their uh, teenagers, the first thing they look for is a big cohort of other teenagers, you know, they want to create a safe, but large social environment. We're starting from a very small base. You already saw the issues that we're having with our budgets, and we would need not just a senior pastor, but we would need a full-time youth pastor, and we would need additional resources. And by additional resources, normally you go to the parents of teenagers, but when you don't have parents yet, you have to hire those people. You know, so it would be a very expensive strategy when you consider the financial constraints that we face 
to try to all of a sudden build a program that would look attractive to a whole bunch of parents and teenagers. And we still got to deal with the fact that they're not going to walk in one Sunday and see people that look just like them. Now, can we build a replacement strategy around empty nesters? Maybe, maybe not. I personally think it's the best chance we have because empty nesters are within one generation of about 95% of our current members. You know, if you look 20 years older than you or 20 years younger than you, and you're around 55 years old, you're gonna, everybody else here is probably gonna look a lot like you. So we could ask for a pastor with experience building spiritually oriented ministries for this cohort. The reason I say spiritually, these are going to be people who aren't likely aren't going to have, as we go forward, aren't going to have grown up in a church environment. So we're going to have to attract them, not by being the United Methodist Church, but by being a bunch of spiritual seekers that they can affiliate with. Again, this is just my thoughts designed to inform the beginning of what I hope will be a broad, a very broad conversation. These are the demographics of Los Gatos. You're now on the next to last slide. In some ways, Los Gatos is just a slightly younger version of all the people on this Zoom call. You know, we have, you know, so what you see, the zero are folks age zero to five years old. So then the five-year-old to nine-year-old, the 10-year-old to 15-year-old. So there are some kids around here, but then they go off to college. You know, the 20, you know, the 20 to 25-year-olds, there aren't very many of them. And then guess what? They don't just come back home after college. And why is that? Well, if you've looked at house prices in Los Gatos, you know why that is. There is no such thing as a young starter family home in Los Gatos. This is not the place where you start raising the, that family. Now, what we do see is a big demographic bulge from really age 45 to age 59, both male and female on both sides of that curve. So what we have are people who have gained success in their careers in all likelihood, either that or they were born into money, but they've, they've gained success in their careers. They're at an age where their kids are going off to college and they're living here in Los Gatos because they like it and they can afford it. So Los Gatos, you know, there, there is a, a cohort of people who are at or just a little below the, uh, the age of, of at least um, a significant chunk of our demographic. And that's something to build from. Last slide, can we get there from here? Well, two thirds of our members actually think we have the sufficient resources to, to develop new ministries. And uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that 80% of that two thirds are realistic enough to understand that we can't grow new ministries without having to make some hard decisions about retiring some of our existing ministries. So we're gonna to have to decide what our focus is and then decide where our focus isn't. Um, and I will leave everybody there. I'm gonna take a breath. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get a drink of water and then I'll entertain any questions you have, especially the ones I don't have answers for. Mm -hmm. That was a great presentation. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> very, very interesting and informative. Very now, oh, by the way, if, if you like, I hope I, I want to leave the recording on because I'd like to capture the questions. If anybody has a question that they don't want to possibly be out there in the cloud, say something. I'll pause the recording. Well, I don't think I can do anything with the recording. If Jennifer's around, I'll ask her to pause the recording if anybody asks. I can't see everybody's faces anymore. I can do that if you need. Cool. So if you raise your hand, I may or may not see you. So just, you know, yell out any question you may have. Kate, make up a question. Come on. <laughs> um, I, I had a comment uh, that I could interject here. Um, on that um, slide about the growing growing our numbers versus nurturing the congregation. And I was just thinking one reason to have as many people in nurturing the congregation is that we've been apart for a long time. Yeah. And that, that seems like it would be um, important, more important than it might be in a normal, in a normal cycle. I think you're right. Uh, 
Tom and I have had a lot of conversation about this. You know, we have an outside actor here, you know, I mean, all of our numbers are skewed by COVID and some number, you know, uh, Tom and I've had these discussions. We can make an equally valid argument, we think, that COVID skewed the, the numbers in this direction or in this direction. You know, you, you, you can argue it either way. I, I, know that, I know that COVID affects these numbers, um, but now is the time we had in order to, you know, put our information in for a pastoral appointment. Right. I, I would like to see us, you know, sample the, these numbers again, you know, in, um, without, you know, without going another X number of years before doing it, you know. And, and having moved this kind of survey into a survey monkey kind of environment, it's not that difficult to, to sample again downstream. And I, I'm not offering you a response so much as just as, you know another observation that complements yours. <laughs> Are you okay, honey? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, but big series of Linda's Friedman or Code Breaker. Your new desk. Hmm? Your new desk. Yeah. I, so I guess one question could be: So what are we going to do with all this? Uh, well, the narrative, the narrative that went to uh, the DS, we assume will be passed on to a pastoral candidate somewhere down the road. So we made that. Uh, I will say, um, you know, Tom, correct me if if you disagree. I think SPR tried to have that memo for the record be sort of divided between here's some data on us, but also here's our resume as a congregation. So we actually focused on the service orientation of this congregation, because that's something that speaks to a non-COVID time. To your point, Christina, um, you know, we talked about lighting for literacy. You know, we talked about what we have been doing in the local community and in communities far and wide. Uh, we talked about the VIM stuff. You know, what we try to do is sort of make it like um, our resume, uh, if you will, as a congregation. So it wasn't just here are some facts on this congregation, but here's the passion of this congregation. So, um, so hopefully we're presenting ourselves well and um, I guess that's all I wanted to say about that. <laughs> I would like to, to um, add to that, Ray. Um, in the SPR discussion, one thing we keyed on was the fact that service didn't come out. Among the things that we, we valued and liked about our church, um, that the design of the survey didn't elicit almost any answers about service. I mean, there was a phrase outreach was in there, but to me, it didn't seem crystal clear what that might meant, mean, and I don't think it came up much, but whatever. Um, most of us on SPR responded to the, what we perceived as an absence of that work intuitively, or just believe in our own eyes and what we all value. We know that service is really, really important to this church. It's part of our DNA, as you said, Ray. So one person came up with a really nice formula for this. Um, which was that we want to be nurtured so that we can in turn go out and nurture and give. It's sort of like we view really good pastoral care and spiritual um, inspiration as nurturing to us and, and giving to us such that it encouraged us and enabled us to go out and give in our community and in the, in the world. And, so they're both really important to us was yeah. what we took out of that. And I think I agree with the point about COVID. And I think we've been lucky the last 10 years and nine and a half now of having two pastors who are do really good at pastoral care and are very nurturing. And uh, I for one would, would hate to, <laughs> to imagine we would go without that the next time around. I, so I think we, we, you know, we've had that experience. We don't want to lose that. Also, Ray, I noticed that when we were having um, work Sundays, you know, our 20 minute sermon and we had people, um, we seemed to have a larger group. And it, um, it had in it, in that group, people who weren't regular church members. 
And in fact, I know of three people that keep saying, when are you going to have another work day? I want to make sure I'm there. And they're not interested in attending a regular church uh, service. So that says something about the area we live in and what they're looking for, too. I, I would completely agree <laughs> with you, Reed, in, you know, in, in a couple of ways. You know, one of them is some people are oblivious, but I think the majority of people who experience good fortune, uh, you know, want to do something to express gratitude for that. They understand that the world isn't all about them and, and they try to create those opportunities to serve. So I, I think living in an affluent community, there is an opportunity to, to find people like that. The other thing, and this is again, a personal speculation. I think that there are people out there who are interested in spiritual, spiritual things, but they want secular cover to go to church. <laughs> they don't want to just show up on Sunday because it's Sunday, but if you give them an opportunity to serve the community, then that's the secular cover to engage in an essentially spiritual activity, spiritual, spiritually nurturing activity. But also when you get together in those kinds of situations, it gives you a point to start from when where you don't know people. I mean, like we're putting in the vegetables and the, the meal and all of that kind of stuff. And we're laughing and we're talking and it gives you some connections. It does. And uh, just like even trying to grommet those uh, lightning for literacy uh, things. It, we were talking about, we started talking about it. And from there we went on, but it was a fun, invigorating activity. And um, sometimes we forget that. And that's a very Christian thing is to have fun, to have fellowship and be in this invigorating activity. It's not, it's not um, a bad thing to do or to be. And so that's what I've noticed with those kinds of Sundays. Well, I'm glad we're recording this because I want to go back and capture those words later. <laughs> Oh, I had a comment related to that one. And it seemed to me, I, I may have remembered this incorrectly, that the service Sundays, in the beginning, we had more people. And in the later ones, we had less people than would have norm, normally attended the two services. Mm -hmm. But... I like those and I hope we can resume them. I think that that's true, but I think with the first, we had a variety acti of activities you could sign up for. Mm -hmm. Because nobody stepped up to head that, it became a real quick, we're just doing this uh, one activity. And lots of times it was the same activity we had done several times before. Mm -hmm. It was a matter of nobody stepping up to find these activities and have them varied to go with people's interests. Um, we kind of crunched down to just making meals or cleaning our own property, you know, that kind of thing, watching the, um, and that's another thing. Uh, members will come clean our kitchen, but to ask the neighborhood to come clean your kitchen is not gonna happen. <laughs> so, you know, that's what we need to remember too. This is true. You know, maybe there's a way to turn that around. We could go to people who are outside the congregation and say, we've got a group of people who are willing to work on your community project. See what I'm saying? You know, we, we volunteer ourselves as the unskilled labor. And then by definition, we get a project manager because the hard to the point that you were raising, the hard part is us sustaining um, things that are volunteer intensive, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use shower ministry as an example, when we have an aging congregation, you know, people love this stuff, but at some point they can't do it anymore. Right. So well, maybe we ought to get our like own kind of you know, sort of project volunteers by, by going to the secular community and saying, we'll offer you uh, a work group. That sounds great to me.
Anything else out there? I mean, this, this fortunately, this does not require a vote or any other <laughs> any other thing that's formal here. Let me uh, actually, does it, if anybody has any questions, I'll uh, move the slides around. Otherwise, I'm just going to go ahead and stop sharing here so I get everybody's faces back again. Right. Um, yeah, just one more thing. And I think maybe um, social justice fits in this kind of in the same category of service. It's also something that's been really important to our church for a lot of years. And so what you did with this survey in the end, with the, the um, memo, if you will, that went to the district superintendent was to add in a prologue. That's what you were referring to, kind of a resume, so that we were sure to give a full picture of the church. And so it augmented what was in the survey, which I was very happy to see. Yeah, I, it was... Yeah, it was definitely not just a, um, you know, a, a dry statistical survey report, uh, like, like, we were, like I think Tom's implying here. We really tried to get some of the passions of the congregation uh, to come across both to the DS and uh, to our next pastor. You want me to stop recording? Yes, please. Um, if 